Hello friends, Dr. David Katz with another COVID reality check. I think this one will be brief. Uh, I sometimes surprise myself and, and talk for longer than I intended. Uh, but I just want to advocate for the value of uncertainty, acknowledging uncertainty. None of us has perfect knowledge. Uh, almost every expert has been wrong about something related to the pandemic, uh, in, including people who've been right about an awful lot. And we can get this wrong in a variety of ways. There's a column in today's New York Times, as I record this, by Nick Kristoff, recommending that we need to follow the science. And one of the things he talks about is the opposition to using masks by people who are not willing to follow the science. Well, here's something really interesting. There's actually opposition to mask use because of people being too dogmatic about science. Specifically, there are very few randomized controlled trials of mask use to prevent exposure to SARS-CoV-2. And the one RCT that's gotten the most attention showed minimal effect. On the other hand, you can't randomly assign people to avoid exposing other people to the virus. All you can do is study the person wearing the mask. And what we've all heard is true. The mask may protect you a bit, but it's much more likely to protect other people. Extremely hard to study. What it all comes down to then is there is a difference between evidence of absence, which would be you've definitively studied something every which way you need to study it and shown it doesn't work, versus absence of evidence, which is we're really not able to study this the way we might like to or we haven't been able to yet. We simply don't have the data. All we've got is sense. And in order to let sense lead and science follow requires trust. It requires humility. We have to acknowledge we're not going to have all of the facts. And sometimes the best we can do is follow where sense leads and then try to catch up. Trust, but verify. Verify or refute. Sometimes we'll, we'll be wrong. It's interesting to note that some of the leading pandemic experts who now advocate for mask use actually recommended the opposite earlier in the pandemic. They've changed their minds. And, and I know some of you from comments listed after my other videos think that, that I have changed my mind about things related to the pandemic. Well, you know, in some instances I have. Changing your mind is not a bad thing. That's not waffling. That's not inconsistency. If the data change and you don't change your mind, then you're narrow-minded. You're closed-minded. You're far too rigid. You're obstinate. And you have too much conviction in your own infallibility. I'm fallible. So I've done the best I can every step of the way in the pandemic to, to make sense of the available information. But the information has been incomplete. And as more information comes in, my perspective evolves. This, this notion that we can all honor the value of uncertainty, and, and we might all do with a bracing dose of humility, and, and, and you know, to be clear, it is our political divisions, it, it, it is the polarization of society that encourages all of us to dig in and defend our point of view and act more certain than we really are. The experts are not certain about everything to do with the pandemic, neither are the rest of us. We're all doing the best we can with imperfect information. Honor the uncertainty. Honor the humility. And so there are practical manifestations of this. We now have the availability of a vaccine, and you know some people are probably eager to get it. A lot of people are quite reticent, worrying about the potential harms of the vaccine. Now, let's be clear. A vaccine that's only recently become available and has been tested in relatively small populations, tens of thousands, but still relatively small compared to tens of millions or hundreds of millions, over relatively short periods of time, weeks to a couple of months, can't tell us everything we might like to know about what will the effects be in populations of, of millions upon millions and what will the long-term effects be. But on the other hand, we don't have any information about the long-term effects of SARS-CoV-2 either. And so it's possible that years after exposure to this virus, we'll have increased vulnerability to autoimmune disease. We don't know because we've only had nine or 10 months of pandemic experience with this virus. What does it do over five years? What does it do over 10 years? So if we're going to invoke uncertainty as a reason to be hesitant about 
the vaccine, let's invoke the same uncertainty to be hesitant about exposing ourselves to the virus, which is pretty much the alternative. I mean, one way or another, we need to get to the end of this pandemic so we can get our lives back. And ultimately, pandemics are over when enough people are immune that the virus stops circulating at a high level. There are two paths to immunity. You get the infection and develop immunity from it, or you get a, a vaccine and develop immunity that way. I believe the vaccine is likely to be the safer option for people at elevated risk from the virus. Once we get to very low risk groups, the math may become more challenging because there are people who appear to be at very low risk of harm from the virus. That's, that was my view from the beginning. Uh, it's still my view. The, the, the fundamental things that I weighed in about at the start of all this have not changed. We have other pandemics hiding in plain sight. We are complacent about them, pandemics of obesity, chronic disease, lifestyle at odds with human health. That's a huge mistake to ignore all of that. Those are all huge liabilities during the pandemic. We need to care about the harms both of viral infection and the ramifications of societal shutdown, and we should be aiming to minimize total harm. And absolutely, we can, although it's getting late, um, and from my point of view, should have matched the level of protection to the level of risk, the apparent risk from SARS-CoV-2, so a risk-stratified approach. Th those were my key points in the beginning. I still think those are fundamentally valid and most important. But I've also been humbled by this pandemic. I, I've confessed to this audience before, and I, I do it quite readily. I was wrong about the pandemic timeline. I, I thought that people who had managed to stay away from the virus this long would continue to stay away from the virus, that it would burn itself out, and we would be through this in the United States by around the beginning of October. Now, here we are in the middle of December, and we've clearly got quite a long way to go before it's over. So I was wrong. Uh, I'm doing the best I can with imperfect information. That's important. The information is imperfect. None of us knows for sure. So I'm just encouraging you to recognize the uncertainty, honor it, uh, try to renounce dogma and obstinacy. Uh, it, it may be I'm preaching to the choir, right? People who are interested in my point of view, which has always been pretty centrist and, and willing to look in both directions and consider the, the merits and the demerits and arguments to left and right of me. Maybe the very fact that you're here means you're in that camp and you agree. But most people uh, have, have declared their allegiance to a tribe, and that invites certainty. My tribe is right, your tribe is wrong, and you know, I'm, I'm going to oppose anything that doesn't line up with my ideology. That's a mistake, because our, our ideologies about the pandemic were put together with very imperfect information. Our understanding has evolved. And if you're going to be concerned about the potential harms of the vaccine over the long term, okay. But you also need to be concerned about the potential harms of exposure to the virus over the long term, because in neither case do we have a, a multi-year experience to reflect back on and make the distinction. What the history of public health tells us is that the vaccine is overwhelmingly likely to be the far safer option. That doesn't mean it won't hurt some people. You do something to millions upon millions of people, there will be idiosyncratic responses, allergic responses. Some people will be harmed, but many, many fewer than will be harmed by exposure to the virus in all probability, particularly if the vaccine is directed to high-risk groups initially. And that's the best we can do at this point. The best option about a pandemic is not to be in one. Once you're in a pandemic, all of your options carry some risk. And so the best decision making is what guides us toward minimal harm to everybody, total harm minimization, least potential risk, greatest potential benefit. That does not mean zero risk. And I, I think it helps for us to communicate to one another to acknowledge, you know, the vaccine's not going to be a panacea. It's not going to work in everybody. It's not going to protect absolutely everybody. Some people will have an ineffective immune response to it and it will inevitably harm some people. And we don't want that to happen, but you do any medical procedure in a large enough population and sometimes something bad happens. It's inevitable. Of course, you know, enough people cross the street and somebody gets hit by a car. So, you know, the, the, the notion that we can get to zero risk in anything that we do um, while living uh, is misguided. So again, the, the goal is, is to minimize the risk. I think vaccination does that. I'm not concerned, by the way, about the 
rapidity of vaccine development. My real concern about the timeline was that we wouldn't be able to develop a vaccine in time to help with the pandemic. So I, I applaud the scientists who developed novel methods, made novel use of messenger RNA to accelerate the vaccine development timeline. It doesn't really change the composition of the vaccine in any meaningful way, and it doesn't change the risks of the vaccine. And I, I have uh, an abiding faith in the value of vaccines based on historical epidemiology. Uh, you know, again, one of the reasons there's so much anti-vax sentiment in modern society is that modern society is spared the barrage of infectious disease that has been removed courtesy of vaccines. So if we were awash in polio every spring and summer, and if we were still subject to smallpox, we'd be very eager for vaccines. If measles were still killing large numbers of children, we'd be very easy, uh, eager for vaccines. We've had vaccines that are highly effective for long enough now for us to mostly forget about the really bad state of epidemiology before all that, and now to focus on the potential harms of the vaccine. That, that, you know, that's familiarity breeding contempt, and, and that should also factor into your considerations. I'm not telling you what to do. You know, I'm not the boss of you. You're the boss of you. I fully respect that. But I am suggesting that at this very fraught time in history, this very polarized society, where we have the internet and the infodemic and sociopolitical influences all goading us to gravitate to extremes of opinion and mistake that opinion for knowledge and understanding is actually to move toward the middle where we acknowledge our uncertainties, recognize that absolutely no one has been right about everything to do with the pandemic, look at all our options with humility, recognize that no option comes with zero risk, uh, and embrace the path forward that offers us and the people we love and care about the opportunity for the least likely risk, greatest net benefit. It's the best any of us can do. Until next time, stay well.